Well, children and the family was selected as one of the premier issues to be addressed by City Club this year. And in that light, our program today focuses on public services that are of great importance to the welfare of our families. Kevin Concannon, Director of the Oregon Department of Human Resources, joins us today to share policy strategies that his agency will pursue in investing our limited state human resource dollars. Many tough questions need to be answered. What services to cut? What needs will go unmet? And at what longer term cost? Prior to becoming Director of the Oregon Department of Human Resources in 1987, Kevin Concannon served as an administrator of the Oregon Mental Health Division and as Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and Mental Retardation for the State of Maine. He has had a number of national leadership roles, including President of the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and he is currently President of the American Public Welfare Association, which is an organization of the 50 state health and welfare offices. Kevin has a master's degree in social work, and he also serves as an adjunct professor of social work at Portland State University. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Concannon. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to be with you today and to share some thoughts on this, uh, these very important subjects. Some years ago, a writer and commentator observed, and I quote, the real voyage of discovery is not in traveling to a new land, but rather in seeing familiar things differently. Well, that certainly can be said of the Oregon Department of Human Resources. We have been on our own voyage of discovery. We are seeing familiar needs and viewing differently familiar elements of those needs such as the role of families, of children, of senior citizens, of schools, and frankly, how we do business. We are in the midst of change. Some of the ingredients, ingredients of those changes involve strengthening various prevention strategies. They also involve focusing our state policies around the critical importance of employment, and jobs to our clients. They involve the fuller utilization of electronic technology. They involve, frankly, changes in our service delivery system. And finally, more enlightened, inclusive policies for people with disabilities. We are building upon the major priorities of the last several years and also are expanding a number of those strategies. It will come as no surprise to anyone here today that we, are, we find ourselves prioritizing uh, through a strategic prioritization process not only our dollar commitments but our application of our people resources as well as our material resources. And this was so even before the advent and the impact of Ballot Measure 5 because we know very directly we'll never have all of the resources, the financial resources, that we may be able to justify and need for the various problems and issues coming our way. So we find ourselves increasingly looking at what are some of the prevention strategies that can make a difference. And unfortunately, like many a hospital outpatient emergency room, we find ourselves triaging, serving the most seriously affected and needy and find ourselves putting to the back of the line, if in line at all, persons with less severe needs. But we also find us on an encouraging note, discovering what I call value added connections with other public systems. And among those value added opportunities are ways in which we as a human service system, not only the state agency, but its local counterparts, public and private, how we can interact more consistently with education systems, for example. Our voyage also parallels some of what will be major priorities in the new presidential administration. I am pleased to be involved on behalf of the state and on behalf of the American Public Welfare Association with the incoming administration on matters related to welfare reform and self-sufficiency. 
I think that's long overdue in terms of a, a national focus and priority. And uh, I am hopeful that we'll see some, some implementable, if there is such a word, recommendations forthcoming in coming months. As well, we are indirectly connected to uh, efforts nationally to reform our health care system, and I'll speak more directly to that momentarily. But first, uh, I was reminded in being invited today, and that was reinforced when I observed the, the public radio engineer here give a signal to your president. I was reminded of a visit I made to Hood River in the spring of the year. It was to visit several of our branch offices and to acknowledge the work of several firms in that part of the state who have volunteered and made major contributions to children's services. I was invited uh, the oh, week or so before I was, I was scheduled to go, I received a call advising me that in Hood River, the local radio station has a one-hour breakfast talk show five days a week from eight to nine. They said they'd really like to have you on that program this particular day. I said, that sounds like a good idea. So I drove over to Hood River and got there about uh, 15 minutes before airtime and it was in a beautiful old hotel and people were having wonderful breakfasts and we proceeded to, there were two interviewers, we proceeded to have a very light, bantering, easy discussion about uh, windsurfing, about the relative health of one of the more, uh, the better known breweries in uh, Hood River, about the cost of housing in that part of the state and about the changing demographics of Hood River County. And as I said, it was very easy and pleasant and bantering. And then at 8.05, the engineer dropped his hand, signaling that the national, the five-minute national news that uh, had run over the station was over, and we went live. And there was, having spent much of my life in the, in the mental health field, there was almost a discernible personality change <laughs> in the two interviewers, two people who had been easy to talk to about housing and windsurfing and weather, uh, all of a sudden there was a much sharper edge to the exchange. And after kind of a perfunctory good morning, Hood River, and it's 52 degrees out, and this is Thursday and the following date, they proceeded to say that there was a guest uh, with them that morning from state government, uh, the director of one of the state's uh, largest agencies, the Department of Human Resources, Kevin Concanon, uh, Mr. Concanon, welcome to Hood River. I said, well, it's very nice to be here. I said, Mr. Concanon, the question was framed in the following way. The first question out of the box, I hope you're going to be easier, Alan. Uh, the first question was, Mr. Concanon, our listeners uh, these days reflect to us large concerns about the credibility of government at all levels. State government, federal government, local government, what are you doing about that? At that point, I regretted that I was drinking decaffeinated coffee. <laughs> but after a moment, it, it gave me an opportunity, and since then, that has influenced uh, the way I've tried to communicate some of what we're doing. It gave me an opportunity to share with them and their listeners uh, a, a very important fact that, that heretofore had gone uncommunicated, undetected. I advised them that in preparing for that visit to the, that area of the state, because I was going to several of our branch offices and meeting with private not-for-profit agencies and local county officials, that I had uh, done, had a briefing prepared for me on client serves, health issues, uh, a variety of factors. And one of the more striking uh, data that, that I had picked up in that review was that in the previous calendar year, in 1991, the state of Oregon's Medicaid program had paid for the prenatal care of and the deliveries of 53% of the births of live children in Hood River County. Now, this was a statistic that caught the interviewers off guard, happily from my point of view, and, uh, and we proceeded then to talk at length about this. And uh, on the serious side, I said, you know, it's unfortunate. That's something that happens every day that has huge implications for our workforce, for families, for prevention in terms of health care. It's a two-generation effort, yet it goes unremarked and unnoticed. Yet, if there had been a scandal at the local hospital, if, if physicians or others had fraudulently billed the state's Medicaid program, or if there had been some sort of controversy, you might have been aware of it. 
but the fact that it goes on quietly, but very importantly, because this is a program that has a far reach, I think is telling about the time in which we find ourselves. And uh, part of that responsibility clearly rests with government, I think, to tell the story better. But part of it as well, I think, reflects the fact that increasingly, I think, people get their news electronically and they don't take the time to sit down and perhaps uh, read through the newspaper. And uh, it's, uh, it to me was uh, an opportunity then to, to talk and share with their listeners the changing demographics and some of the factors that are influencing what we do in that particular county. Well, I'd like to share with you some selected demographics and background factors that are influencing our state and influencing human resources in Oregon. And these are factors, uh, demographics, numbers that largely changed. I'm going to talk about those that, that changed in, 19, in the decade just ended, 1980 to 1990. And at the top of my list, a very powerful uh, background factors that clearly affect the quality of life and absolutely affect uh, government uh, at all levels, was the nearly 26% increase among, in Oregon, of, of persons living in poverty. Very substantial increase in the 10-year period of poor persons in our state. And largely that increase has come with children, with families that have very young family members, and with single parent households. And that has huge implications for a variety of services. Just as strikingly during that 10-year period, there was a doubling of the rate of impoverishment among minorities and persons of color. Again, underscoring the disparity in opportunities between the dominant or the majority race and people of, of color in our state. There was a 50% increase in Oregon in the numbers of food stamp recipients. For example, this month, 270,000 Oregonians will receive food stamp benefits, 270,000. There was a 35% increase in the rate of aid to families with dependent children, the largest cash welfare program, not only in Oregon, but in the country. And actually, our rate of increase in that regard has not paralleled what has been happening nationally. Right now in the US, we have a record number of, <coughs> excuse me, persons, adults and children receiving AFDC benefits. The births to single parents, to single mothers, doubled in the last decade. And this has some very ominous implications for everything from readiness for school to rates of impoverishment. There was a doubling of the delinquent youth in our institutions for serious person-to-person -person felonies in the state institutions just since 1985. And the impact of rising health care costs, I don't think there is an adjective powerful enough to, to describe the meteoric rise of health care costs in our country. They're not just a concern. They are the number one concern among the poorest people in our country, as expressed in Roper polls and other polls that have been done asking poor people what are their concerns. But they're the concerns, as was demonstrated, I think, during the presidential election of all Americans. And if you saw any of the, the, uh, the economic uh, meeting that was held in Little, Ro Little Rock a month or two ago, the striking uh, imagery that, that I recall from that was the General Motors executive describing that for every American car built by General Motors, the costs associated with health care for GM employees is higher than the cost of the rolled steel in the automobile. It's now somewhere around 14% of gross domestic product as a portion of our country's uh, economy and rising. The persistence of high school dropouts and school failures, again, is deeply troubling uh, because we haven't really made very much progress in 20 years in that regard. It's still for every ninth grade cohort that enters schools across our state four years later one out of five, some cases one out of four of those students aren't there on the graduating stage. 
And I, we don't need to remind each other of what that does to, to that individual person as well as to the competitive position of the state. Finally, I might say in the selective list, a 40 percent increase in the number of senior citizens age 75 and over in our state. And that has huge implications for our social and health services system. Well, what to do with some of this, this uh, background on, on uh, driving forces or demographics? What to do as a state? Well, in part influenced by my visit to Hood River Radio, and in part because over the years I kept noticing on newsstands and airports or in supermarket uh, turnstiles this magazine, and I'm not promoting it here today for you, but Money Magazine is something I couldn't help notice in, in various newsstands. In this aspect of Money Magazine, their editors, I assume through polling or, or, uh, or uh, focus groups or otherwise, has determined that there's something very powerful about putting a number on things. If you notice, if you see this magazine, some months it'll say six things to do immediately to lessen your tax burden, or eight things to guarantee that you can retire young and healthy. Well, this is this month's issue, and as you can see, it's 12 mutual funds to buy right now. Well, with some editorial license, I have appropriated to myself for this, for this speech today the uh, temporary editorship of Money Magazine, and uh, these are the 10 strategies that Oregon Human Resources is pursuing, 10 strategies in our portfolio that are likely to impact significantly the state over time for the better. At the top of my list of strategies is welfare reform. I mentioned earlier the rise in the number of poor people in our state and significantly so, the rise in the number of children and single parent families. That's why, and I, I can't, we could spend a whole day talking about the implications of being poor in terms of safety, in terms of health, in terms of opportunity, in terms of access. There are many, many things that, that, uh, that spin out from that, virtually all of them uh, adverse. So we're very focused on the opportunity presented to us through the Family Support Act, federal legislation, and something called a jobs program. We have made a very consistent investment. Governor Roberts has made it one of her priorities. We, have, we are the only state in the country that has expended more state dollars in the Family Support Act and the jobs program than is matchable by federal funds. This is a federal state program, or significant portions of it are. And in Oregon, we have unambiguously made our highest priority for this program teen parents. These are basically, I think I need not tell you, uh, a, a very troubling epidemic of young persons in their teen years, children having children, basically. Well, the focus on teen parents in our welfare program is triggered by the following facts that we recognize. If you look at public welfare programs in our country and look at public welfare programs in the state of Oregon, the AFDC program that I referred to earlier, more than half of the heads of welfare families, and these are about 95 percent single parent families, more than half of the heads of families either are or were teen parents. So teen parenthood is a major risk factor. When you look deeper into that phenomenon, you see that four out of five teen parents have not completed high school. I need not tell you what the opportunity quotient might be if you haven't completed high school in 1993. And we look even further into our children's services uh, division or our child protective services the children who have been found to be so severely abused or neglected that they require the involvement of the state in the courts, and more than two out of five families involves someone who is or was a teen parent. Hence our focus on teen parents. Well, Oregon has succeeded. We, we sought federal waivers of certain exemptions and federal rules so that we uh, have made that priority of teen parents return to school so much a part of our values and our culture that we lead the country in the numbers and percentage 
of teen parents who are back in school. As we meet here today, some 86 percent of teen parents in Oregon are back in school. They're back in programs like the Pivot program over in the operated by the Portland school system, or there, there are programs like that out in Ontario. You don't have to come to the urban areas of the state. And uh, that has drawn national attention to us, rightly so, because this population is so critical. It is overrepresented among the ranks of the poor and among the ranks of people for whom public systems need to intervene. We have been successful enough in that regard that earlier, or the end of 1992, the Oregon Community College System was recognized nationally as having the highest rate of increase of GED, general equivalency diploma programs. About a third of these young women go back to their high schools. The rest go to community colleges or JTPA agencies. We make it a priority. We think it's an urgent priority. And it's a prevention program for two generations. And I've, I happened to speak at one of the, these high school graduations uh, this year. And it was as, as uh, moving as any uh, major graduation I've been to. And we know the results are, are showing up in our caseload numbers of persons being placed into the economy. We haven't paralleled the rate of increase in welfare recipients that is true nationally. And we're placing about uh, 600 persons a month from our welfare program into jobs. We do that by helping people with daycare, by helping people with Medicaid benefits or extended health care, by helping people with transportation, and by helping people deal with, uh, with, with barriers, with the history that they may bring as a young person. But I find that among the most promising. We need to do more, not less. I think we're stretched to the limits as a state. Uh, but the governor, and the, even with the proposed uh, ballot five cuts, she has proposed no reduction in the level of effort here. And I'm certainly going to do all I can to make sure that we hold the line on that uh, in the Oregon legislature. Because to do less guarantees an endless line of people who will be dependent in the future. Second in my list uh, in this portfolio is the Oregon Health Plan. I mentioned earlier rising health care costs. Uh, Americans, I think, clearly are and need to be dissatisfied with our health care system. Uh, we have 35 million Americans without health care. We have 450,000 Oregonians of a nearly 3 million person population without health care. We, the first building block and the major one in, the, in closing this gap, is an expansion of the state's Medicaid program. We filed an application a year and a half ago in that regard. You'll recall we got turned down for, I think, fairly not very substantive uh, reasons. Uh, we refiled that in November. And I watched uh, the C-SPAN channel some couple of weeks ago as the secretary designate had her confirmation hearing and was very encouraged when she remarked she was directly knowledgeable of, uh, of our application. And I am hopeful that it will receive a prompt review early in this administration. We need to move forward with this, not only for the 450,000 Oregonians who don't have health care, but this plan and this effort has far broader implications for every business person, for everybody who's concerned about our workforce, for everybody who's, who is concerned about uh, families. Because uh, by extending the reach of the health care system, and the first 120,000 persons would be covered by Medicaid, the next 330,000 persons would be covered by a pay or play system of insurance for a basic set of benefits. We would go far, first of all, in ridding one of the principal drivers of increased health care cost, and that is the phenomenon of cost shifting. Persons who don't have health insurance or who are underinsured have use, uh, need to use the health care system, and this largely happens in hospitals. That cost doesn't disappear. It gets redivided into your health care premiums. About a third of the increase is attributable to uninsured persons. We'll deal with that in this way. Secondly, the Oregon plan is characterized by a very clear commitment to managed care, to bringing people into a system of health care that is more preventive in its orientation, 
that pays more attention to people getting their immunizations, getting their pap smears, getting their checkups, getting their blood pressure down, and it reimburses people uh, similarly so that we, we are paid to keep people healthy, not to treat them uh, when their, the calamity hits in terms of their getting ill. We already are one of the leaders in the country in the percentage of public welfare Medicaid recipients who are in managed care. Some states are still having the debate, should we have managed care or not? We had a Coopers and Libran study examine the, the cost implications of, of uh, managed care. And uh, it has very measurable payouts in terms of dollars. Uh, we believe it's a sound investment for us. Some people estimate between 2 to 3 percent of health care costs can be reduced. We know it's preventive. And uh, we're headed down that road very much so. And as I say, I hope I hear soon on the health plan, we think it's very important. It needs to be financed, and I'll get to that at the end of my remarks. But it's important for us to do it because it has huge implications on people on the workforce, on the ability of employers to employ people, on where people move or don't move, it has far-reaching implications beyond health alone. Our efforts with senior citizens. The night before last, NBC National News featured Oregon, if you happen to see it, I think it was Wednesday night of this week, featured the Oregon system of care for senior citizens. We are the only state in the country, even though I noted we have a 40 percent increase in persons over 75 in the last 10 years, and that's the age at which you are that and beyond, the age at which you're likely to need supports and intervention. We're the only state in the country that has fewer persons residing in nursing homes today than were there in 1980. We contrast ourselves with states like Colorado that are similarly similar in terms of population size. They serve far fewer people than we do with public resources because they serve the fewer, but more of their persons are in nursing homes. We need nursing homes. We need good nursing homes. But we need a whole series, we need a whole array of other supports before you get to that point. In Oregon, uh, the New York Times a couple of Sundays ago cited us as well. Oregon leads the country in that regard. We continue to look for ways to, to build choices in that array. Again, I'll talk about this as I get to my remarks at the end of this uh, on ballot measure five and cost implications. But we have a vision. People are looking to us. We can do it. Fourth in my list, the turnaround story in, in government, certainly in services for disabled persons and the mentally ill. Fairview Training Center in 1987 was surrounded, it seemed, by layers of lawyers, uh, more lawyers than physicians at one point, uh, because it had fallen so below the threshold of acceptable care. And it was a large, one of only half a dozen such centers in the country of that size. I'm happy to report today rather than 1,000 residents or 1,060 residents uh, at this time of year, we have 450 residents at Fairview. And in those intervening years, we have built brand new homes across the state of Oregon for some 600 of those residents. They are served now closer to home in smaller settings that are just a much sounder investment for the state. And Fairview itself is doing a much better job. It is now cited by the same federal critics as this is how to do it. So I think it was a sound investment for the state. Related to that, that, that experience at Fairview raised the alarm for the state. Of this, if this is true for the, for the developmentally disabled, how about the mentally ill? And we weren't much better off, frankly, for people with mental illness. We have been pursuing a strategy now for, this is three years plus, of building regional centers to serve the seriously psychiatric ill. We had too many people in the state going down and going up the freeway in the back of police cars to psychiatric hospitals. We were too reliant on state hospital care for people with serious episodes of mental illness. I don't have to tell you mental illness affects everyone in terms of income levels. There's no way to immunize yourself against uh, mental illness. It happens uh, in families up and down the income spectrum. Yet, people with persistent and severe mental illness may require the intervention of, of hospital settings beyond that local inpatient unit. We've, we've made major investments in Lane County, in the Rogue Valley Medical Center, the Ryle Center with uh, Multnomah County on the other side of uh, 
the Willamette River here in, in this county, more recently in Corvallis and Salem, and in the next biennium, we propose to add capacity in Washington and Clackamas counties so that we will be less required to send people to state hospitals. They'll get care sooner, closer to home. Alcohol and drug prevention, if you were to ask what's a ubiquitous phenomenon in so many problems, whether it's family dissolutions, whether it's uh, child abuse, whether it's uh, mental illness or other factors, well, alcohol and drug abuse would be right up there on my list. And uh, we, we still have a long ways to go in this regard, but we're encouraged by we do a randomized sample of about 4,000 8th and 11th graders every two years in the state. And last spring when we did it, we saw reductions in both 8th graders and 11th graders in drugs across the, the spectrum. I'm very encouraged by that. We still, by the way, our young people still use drugs at a rate above the national norms, but we've closed the gap. And uh, some of that are, are related to the efforts around the drug-free years, uh, some, some very active uh, partnerships with education systems, curricula, some messaging from the media, and also some changes in laws. You can't buy cigarettes, as you'll note, in, in uh, cigarette machines where young people can have access to it. That's one small step in the direction of, of sending more consistent messages about drugs. Prenatal care, I mentioned that. Oregon now, there are about 41,000 live births annually in our state. The Oregon Medicaid program uh, provides, pays for the prenatal care and the delivery of 35% of the births in the state. In excess of 14,000 women this past calendar year. And that is having a measurable effect already. 65% of those women seek and get involved in prenatal care in the first trimester. Before we started this program, their averages were somewhere around 12 to 14% first trimester. The earlier you get into prenatal care, the better the outcome. And we've seen those outcomes in better APCAR scores and fewer reduced percentages of, uh, of underweight infants. You don't have to be in the healthcare field, you can be in economics to know that for every dollar we spend in prenatal care, we save about four dollars in deferred healthcare costs in the first five years of life. We're very focused on that. Uh, we're having an impact. It's not inexpensive, but I think it's a very worthwhile investment for the state. The employment of people with disabilities is another major area of focus for us. Uh, we, perhaps belatedly, as did every state, recognized too late that a developmentally disabled person or someone with serious mental illness needs an opportunity to work to the extent of his or her ability. Uh, and you'll see people, whether it's at the local Safeway market or elsewhere in public buildings, who now have job opportunities, didn't have them in the past. So much so that last year our vo vocational rehabilitation division, one of the divisions in human resources, led the country in the percentage of persons with serious psychiatric uh, illness who were rehabilitated. Our relationships with schools. Portland is doing some wonderful things through a group called the Leaders Roundtable made up of business people and the mayor of the city and the chair of the Multnomah County Commission and others in, in recognizing that unless we alter the rate of school failures, unless we impact those youngsters I refer to going into grade nine, we guarantee future dependency. We guarantee people who are really going to need more assistance than they can contribute. And uh, we are finding that uh, not only here, but in other parts of the state. I mentioned our teen parent efforts. We have now about 80 contracts across the state with school systems for childcare. Because again, we think it's that important to get people back into school systems. You know we've had connections over the years in terms of health education and special ed. But I think more importantly, we are now seeing the benefits and we have about 14 pilot projects across the state, including one at Roosevelt High School in Portland announced earlier this week, where we will be deploying state employees and county people to work in the schools. And our hope is that we will intervene earlier in the cycle of need and dependency for people. The ninth theory on my list is the use of technology, electronic technology in particular. 
There are three or four exciting areas immediately looming on the horizon that can make a difference in terms of outcomes, public accountability, and access to services. At the top of my list in that regard is something called electronic benefit transfer, EBT. Basically, it's the use of a card, a, a plastic card, not unlike your Visa card, for which we would use instead of mailing food stamps, food coupons, you'll appreciate our uh, separate currency or a, an AFDC check to someone, we would issue those benefits in a card. The person would have a PIN number so that, number one, you would cut down significantly on the problem of theft, people going into people's mailboxes or people stealing coupons from one another. We know that's a problem. Secondly, uh, we would eliminate the dependency that poor people have for those stores you'll see scattered around our state with the signs out front, checks cashed. I fortunately have never had to go into one of those places to cash a check because I can cash a check at a bank or Safeway or somewhere else. It's poor people who go in and pay the $12 to have their checks cashed in those outlets. That was brought home to me very powerfully in Portland here in, in North Portland a couple of years ago. Well, the use of EBT, if we were to issue the benefit that way, and we've had very active cooperation throughout this process, in fact, genuine enthusiasm from the Oregon Bankers Association, because a little known piece of trivia, those uh, ATMs you see scattered across the city and state are only used for a few hours a day. There's a lot of unused capacity there. So they're attracted to this possibility. We're attracted to it. And on the food side, you'll see the major supermarket chains have moved to these point-of-sale technology uh, swipe card uh, devices in the different stores. We're again attracted to that because from the Agriculture Department's point of view, they'd know that the food benefit was only expended on food. can't be used for toothpaste or anything else. From our point of view, from the client's point of view, that family can extend that benefit over the course of 30 days rather than cashing your check on the second of the month and putting it in a coffee can or whatever people do to extend it. We're very attracted to that. A related electronic benefit is something called point of sale technology. This is again uses a card. We would provide this to physicians, to hospitals, to dentists, to pharmacists, to people who provide services to our clients. Right now they have to submit a lot of paperwork, necessarily so, to be paid because we spend billions of dollars in transfer payments. Point of sale technology, which has been used in several states, would allow the person going into a physician's office, they put the swipe card in, a little small device that's fairly inexpensive, attached to their phone line, immediately it comes back for that provider that yes, the person is eligible, yes, the state will pay for this service, and yes, if this is signed, you'll get a check in six days. This would cut down on a huge amount of paper that transfers. In our Medicaid system alone, we have 700,000 transactions per month in Oregon. 700,000 transactions. And those people are already working very hard. We compared them with one of the larger private insurers in the state. We have about half the number of personnel for the number of, of transactions we process. But this electronic uh, point of sale technology would further that. You've seen references to touch screen technology, which is another point we're interested in. And uh, there are several others less important. Now if I can say just a few brief words about ballot measure five. I, like a lot of people, are very worried about the impact of ballot measure five on state budgets. We, uh, we find ourselves faced with, you heard the data at the beginning of this, uh, the presentation, growing number of elderly, growing number of disabled persons who live longer now and who need public assistance growing numbers of poor children, uh, people with uh, rates of mental illness that has not abated. It's a very significant, uh, takes heavy toll on people. So we have the caseload impact. We have the cost of doing business. I don't know of any health care providers who have notified us that it will be less costly to do business with them this year. Uh, if anything, the rate of increase on that side, which is the largest single area of our budget, has doubled the rate of inflation for the past five years. So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the impact of the elderly and the poor. I need to say that 78 cents of every dollar in our department goes out on a transfer payment. So these dollars are not going to, to, to uh, finance legions of state employees. Yes, we have 9,000 state employees in a very large 
system, but 78 cents on the dollar goes out on a transfer payment. Uh, I'm very worried about the budget. Uh, I'm very focused myself on the governor's mandated plus budget, the budget that would increase the beer and wine tax. Very important trivia question, I think, for all Oregonians. How much tax do we pay on a 12-ounce bottle of beer? I've yet to run into anybody who correctly answers the question. It's eight-tenths of one cent. Not 10 cents, not 5 cents, not 12 cents, eight-tenths of one cent. And it's been at that rate for 18 years. There are a lot of problems. You don't have to go too far outside of this hotel to see the impact of alcohol and drug abuse. Eight-tenths of a cent just won't carry their share of it. We very strongly hope that will be increased to five cents a bottle. Cigarette taxes, similarly, again, there's a proposal to go up by 10 cents. A day doesn't go by when the EPA or somebody else, the Centers for Disease Control, doesn't talk to us about the impact of, of tobacco. Again, it has huge implications for us. The use of lottery funds for that jobs program I started talking about, I think it is very important to our future economic development. Uh, it needs to be financed. And finally, a provider tax on health care, which is very controversial, I would submit. But the Oregon Health Plan alone will increase investments in the state in health care by in excess of 300 million public dollars, 300 million. 100 million of that, it's actually in excess of that, but for purposes of this tax discussion, 100 million of it is the state's obligation. We would propose to tax the gross receipts of hospitals, physicians, and dentists in proportion to their benefit that those groups receive, either at 1% or up to 2% of gross receipts to finance that. And uh, I think if we don't go down that road, it means we would be taking 100 million dollars in resources away from other social services. So you can see we are, to go back to my original theme, we are on our own voyage of discovery. Uh, we are trying to see things differently, but I would submit uh, my one day here as, uh, as editor of this uh, magazine, we have 10 strategies in our portfolio that will make a difference. Thank you very much. Kevin, thank you very much for your remarks, and we'll start with a question from Alan Hunt. I was struck as you went through your list that even though you're a public agency, and, and oftentimes because of a public agency seen as the enemy, you are taking care of our most personal needs, our children, our parents, our health. And we set up this dichotomy, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about we need to persuade ourselves that this is our responsibility. We have to pay for it, and I know you were just starting to touch on that, but that seems to me the, the real problem we're left with. We have great strategies, but we've got to come up with the money to pay for them. They're our responsibility. This is perhaps the most, the most difficult question to answer, and, and uh, people from the governor on down have uh, been struggling with that very issue. Uh, I, I have uh, both a pessimistic viewpoint and an optimistic viewpoint in that regard. On the optimistic side, let me say that I, I think I mentioned in passing the survey done by the Oregon Business Council that, that I would be an excellent program perhaps for the City Club as well, but extremely encouraging from my point of view in the high rate of reporting by both men and women on the importance of families to them. These are Oregonians. What really matters to you? And family kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And there was a recognition as well of the urgency of, of health care, the need for health care, the need for something called charitability, and uh, the need to make sure that, that uh, we have an adequately educated population. So to the extent that those core values are really the values of Oregonians, I have some optimism, but it's a longer term optimism. Short term, uh, I, I don't see the, uh, the, uh, the any ease with which we're going to move from where we are right now to, to where we will uh, revise or stabilize, uh, stabilize the, the system of support for these programs. Uh, 
They do cost money. It's, it's an unfortunate phenomenon of human nature. People tend to think it's the other guy, it's the other person who needs it, and it doesn't really affect me. And uh, I've had that experience uh, with, uh, I live in Portland, and on weekends running into people in the neighborhood or elsewhere who, who, who know I work with the state and who feel free to share their comments about the, uh, the financing of government. And uh, they have a tendency not to connect. I have to remind them, those who I know better, about, well, didn't you tell me about your sister who was being cared for here? And they'll say, oh, yes. And I'll say, well, you realize that's publicly financed. This is a very difficult thing to get through on people. I think all we can do is keep trying to interpret to people the uh, strategies and the ways in which we are making those investments. I find myself in traveling outside the state, it's amazing how many people talk about and look to Oregon, really admire the, the strategies that we've pursued over the years in children or elderly or mental health care or others. When you get back home, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the profit syndrome or something. It's, uh, it's a lot tougher sell. Gretchen Beener, I'm a member of the Government and Taxation <clears throat> Committee. I was very impressed with your strategies as you outlined, outlined them in your speech. However, as you could gather, government and taxation, we are very focused on the issues relating to Measure 5. And the fact of the matter is that there's going to be a significant impact on the bottom line dollar availability for the general fund for 1993-95. The facts are you're probably going to have a significant cut in the number of dollars available for your department. How are you going to determine the strategies to address that issue and keep your strategy moving in the direction that you wish? That's an excellent question. And we have uh, given some thought to this. I should say that the proposed reductions in continuing level for our department in the mandated budget, the forest budget, are about $400 million. So that's real dollars. As I mentioned earlier, 78 percent are in transfer payments. Uh, there's no way you can take that kind of cut without severely impacting people. Uh, we do have a strategy in that regard. That is, we, we tried to kind of, we gave this considerable thought and we said, first of all, we have to preserve those things that are critical to health and safety. We have to give priority to those things that will affect people's self-sufficiency. We want to encourage those things that have cost savings potential, and we want to maximize federal funds. Those were kind of the four hallmarks of our approach to this. But even with that, I have to say that we will end up making cuts that very severely and adversely affect persons. An example of that, in our programs for senior citizens, we propose to cut, and we have a priority system of 17 categories, the 17th category of, of care being the person who has the least impairments. We would propose cutting out level 17 in terms of care. That's just under 1,000 elderly Oregonians. We would propose unfunding from state funds the meals, the home delivered meals program that serves tens of thousands of Oregonians across the state. And we would accordingly finance from level 16 up to 1, which is totally dependent. Well, even with that cut in level 17, and even cutting out all the people on home delivered meals, the actual number of people who are in those categories up above goes up. And with our proposed cuts, our seniors' budget goes up by $100 million. $100 million in state and federal funds. I'm talking total funds here but $100 million, that's the rate of increase. I find that people want to talk about the 1,000 seniors who may be left off the list at 17. They're less willing to talk about the fact that this goes up by $100 million. That's real money in any state in the union, and it needs to be financed. We can't just say, well, gosh, we're going to do that because it's an entitlement, and we'll cut more teenage street kids off the caseloads of our Children's Services Division because that's the kind of choice that we have. And by the way, that is one of the categories proposed to be cut uh, in the Children's Services Division, the street kids, whom we know may be more difficult to reach, but if we don't intervene with these kids, they have kids and, uh, and they come back to haunt us otherwise. But you get down to like that triaged uh, outpatient uh, ambulatory care center We've run out of, we've picked the, the, the easy plums over the years, and 
these levels of cuts will leave real harm for people, clearly. Uh, yes. Sid Lezak, City Club member. Uh, I can't resist saying that I wish that as many people were here to hear your wonderful presentation as come to our economic forecasting uh, programs. <laughs> uh, what do we do, those of us who look at the mail and get uh, literally during the year uh, a, a thousand or more requests for private contributions. We have difficulty in making rational judgments about uh, how to make choices as between uh, the, the, these uh, uh, heart-rending uh, appeals uh, that we get. Uh, some, some choice has to be made. Uh, apparently George Bush's thousand points of light wasn't enough. Uh, how can you help us? It's an excellent point. I, I reminded, I had a luncheon a few weeks ago with new legislators. One of the newly elected legislators over lunch said to me, Kevin, you know, I think we're just going to have to rely more on those private voluntary agencies out there. And I said, well, you know, they're already really pushed pretty hard. And if you look at programs like for the homeless, uh, for example, there's far more private investment there than in private dollars than there is public funds. And if you look at the variety of not-for-profit agencies who raise funds in various ways, the last time I was in this very room here was one of those private agencies. There is a limit to, to what can be, can be uh, garnered on that front. I must say one of the areas that we're looking at from, from the public agency point of view, we have really needs up and down the spectrum. But my focus, for example, on teen parents, I, I, I think that if, we, if we're going to have limited dollars, then we're going to hone in on that population because it has double, triple impacts out here in terms of dependency and adequacy and, and being able to get back into school. And so it's, an, it's, a, it's a choice for me in terms of that priority population that we've made after weighing a whole bunch of things. Uh, there are needs of, of street people out on the, the streets of Portland or elsewhere that are real and severe, but in limited dollars, I'm going to recommend basically putting the money into trying to impact on the teen parent side, state dollars anyway, before I'm going to recommend that we put them into uh, the homeless population because we get down to that. Now, that, that's a tough call, but I, I think that's what, that's what we're practicing on the, on the public side. And I think of the many, uh, the many overtures uh, private businesses and individuals receive, I think you have to kind of weigh what kind of an impact does this have on our community? Is it one of those things? I think I didn't spend as much time talking about the hopefulness I feel about connecting our public systems and schools, for example. I think we can help schools get, have better retention rates. And conversely, if we have more people successfully exiting schools, I believe we'll see a decline over time in the people who are dependent on us. And those are areas that aren't just a function of more dollars. It's a function of how we're organized. And I, I personally think maybe ways in which people invest their dollars that show connections between agencies, be they public or private. Alan mentioned uh, he, uh, private agencies. It's really, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very blurred line between public and private because we rely on each other very directly. But that might be a question I would ask. How does this relate to, to other similar efforts and are they connected? Or, you know, can we cut down on the isolation of of certain groups from one another. <clears throat> Dan Goldie, member. Um, Sydney just alluded to uh, the economic <laughs> forecasting sessions we have here and wished there were no the same number of people here. Well, we've had economists come before this club and in effect say <clears throat> that it's a great thing that's happening to the state, that we're cutting back on our resource-based industries and in effect, we're making up for it to some degree by migration of people to the state, many of whom are retirees who are coming in and who add to that average age population you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is this. At the present time, unless the policies are changed, many of our rural communities that are resource-based in this state are going to be shutting down. We're already getting double-digit unemployment in them. They're going to be shutting down. To what extent does the Department of Human Resources here in the state, concerned with all the problems you've outlined today, how, to what extent are they addressing the prospect of the shutdown of those communities, and to what extent do you feed that back into the governor, 
the legislature and the people that are planning these things so that they understand what the possible impact will be on programs of the state. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm very mindful and very directly aware of the phenomenon you're speaking of. Uh, the employment division is one of the sections in our department. We track where the people who release the employment data for the state each month. We're very mindful of the changing characteristics of the Oregon economy. Let me say that very clearly, the retirees who move into the state are a major boon economically to us, and that typically people move in, they're very healthy. Later on, they will impact the, the health and social services system, but they come with resources. They come with educations, so they're a plus, unambiguously a plus. And they're a plus in many of those very communities you speak to, because as I travel downstate in, uh, in some of the counties that are timber uh, heavily dependent, almost singularly timber dependent, what people tell me is the difference between 1981 and 1993 as the timber economy changes is that people in the past could never sell their homes. They were kind of, they had a fixed resource. The fact there might be jobs in Washington County was of little uh, comfort because they couldn't sell their home. Well, for better or for worse, those communities are changing because you can sell your homes in Grants Pass, you can sell your homes in Drain and elsewhere to people who are moving into the state. And that is one of the factors that is changing. The other is that, that the, uh, the, the percentage of timber-related jobs in the state now, for example, in terms of that industry versus 1981 is considerably less than it was 10 to 12 years ago. So we're not the single economy state that, that Oregon was, uh, was uh, such back in the early 80s. It is an impact. Uh, the governor is, uh, is aware of that, but I'm also aware of it as, as, I, as I drive through the state. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, on communities that, that are adversely affected by that, but I think it's, it's where the country is really heading, and I think we need to try to, to provide support for people for retraining, we, uh, we, as I say, have a displaced workers program that we work closely with in our employment division. We work very closely with community colleges to try to position people for the economy. But even with that said, I want to be very clear. I know that you can't move from a manufacturing or a, or a $28,000 or $25,000 a year job, even with retraining, and say I'm going to move into another twenty-five. dollars The fact of the matter is those kind of jobs uh, are declining, not only here, but nationally. I'm sorry we're out of time for questions, but I want to thank Kevin for joining us today and sharing those strategies. Hopefully, as Alan said, we'll realize that these are our problems and we are going to have to pay for them. In closing, I have an announcement that there was a diamond tennis bracelet that may have been lost in this room today. If anyone has any information about it, there is a reward. Uh, I've got the numbers up here if you want to come up afterward. Thank you very much, and we are adjourned. <laughs>